Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. A Room with a View By E. M. Forster Chapter 17 Lying to Cecil He was bewildered. He had nothing to say. He was not even angry, but stood, with a glass of whiskey between his hands, trying to think what had led her to such a conclusion. She had chosen the moment before bed, when, in accordance with their bourgeois habit, she always dispensed drinks to the men. Freddie and Mr. Floyd were sure to retire with their glasses, while Cecil invariably lingered, sipping at his while she locked up the sideboard. I am very sorry about it, she said, I have carefully thought things over. We are too different. I must ask you to release me, and try to forget that there ever was such a foolish girl. It was a suitable speech, but she was more angry than sorry, and her voice showed it. Different, how, how, I haven't had a really good education, for one thing, she continued, still on her knees by the sideboard. My Italian trip came too late, and I am forgetting all that I learnt there. I shall never be able to talk to your friends, or behave as a wife of yours should. I don't understand you. You aren't like yourself. You're tired, Lucy. Tired, she retorted, kindling at once. That is exactly like you. You always think women don't mean what they say. Well, you sound tired, as if something has worried you. What if I do? It doesn't prevent me from realizing the truth. I can't marry you, and you will thank me for saying so some day. You had that bad headache yesterday, all right, for she had exclaimed indignantly, I see it's much more than headaches. But give me a moment's time. He closed his eyes. You must excuse me if I say stupid things, but my brain has gone to pieces. Part of it lives three minutes back, when I was sure that you loved me, and the other part, I find it difficult, I am likely to say the wrong thing. It struck her that he was not behaving so badly, and her irritation increased. She again desired a struggle, not a discussion. To bring on the crisis, she said, there are days when one sees clearly, and this is one of them. Things must come to a breaking point sometime, and it happens to be today. If you want to know, quite a little thing decided me to speak to you, when you wouldn't play tennis with Freddy. I never do play tennis, said Cecil, painfully bewildered, I never could play. I don't understand a word you say. You can play well enough to make up a four. I thought it abominably selfish of you. No, I can't, well, never mind the tennis. Why couldn't you? couldn't you have warned me if you felt anything wrong? You talked of our wedding at lunch, at least, you let me talk. I knew you wouldn't understand, said Lucy quite crossly. I might have known there would have been these dreadful explanations. Of course, it isn't the tennis, that was only the last straw to all I have been feeling for weeks. Surely it was better not to speak until I felt certain. She developed this position. Often before I have wondered if I was fitted for your wife, for instance, in London, and are you fitted to be my husband? I don't think so. You don't like Freddie, nor my mother. There was always a lot against our engagement, Cecil, but all our relations seemed pleased, and we met so often, and it was no good mentioning it until, well, until all things came to a point. They have today. I see clearly. I must speak. That's all. I cannot think you were right, said Cecil gently. I cannot tell why, but though all that you say sounds true, I feel that you are not treating me fairly. It's all too horrible. What's the good of a scene? No good. But surely I have a right to hear a little more. He put down his glass and opened the window. From where she knelt, jangling her keys, she could see a slit of darkness, and, peering into it, as if it would tell him that, little more, his long, thoughtful face. Don't open the window, and you'd better draw the curtain, too, 
Freddy or anyone might be outside. He obeyed. I really think we had better go to bed, if you don't mind. I shall only say things that will make me unhappy afterwards. As you say it is all too horrible, and it is no good talking. But to Cecil, now that he was about to lose her, she seemed each moment more desirable. He looked at her, instead of through her, for the first time since they were engaged. From a Leonardo she had become a living woman, with mysteries and forces of her own, with qualities that even eluded art. His brain recovered from the shock, and, in a burst of genuine devotion, he cried, But I love you, and I did think you loved me. I did not, she said. I thought I did at first. I am sorry, and ought to have refused you this last time, too. He began to walk up and down the room, and she grew more and more vexed at his dignified behavior. She had counted on his being petty. It would have made things easier for her. By a cruel irony she was drawing out all that was finest in his disposition. You don't love me, evidently. I dare say you are right not to. But it would hurt a little less if I knew why. Because, a phrase came to her, and she accepted it, you're the sort who can't know anyone intimately. A horrified look came into his eyes. I don't mean exactly that. But you will question me, though I beg you not to, and I must say something. It is that, more or less. When we were only acquaintances, you let me be myself, but now you're always protecting me. Her voice swelled. I won't be protected. I will choose for myself what is ladylike and right. To shield me is an insult. Can't I be trusted to face the truth but I must get it secondhand through you? A woman's place. You despise my mother, I know you do, because she's conventional and bothers over puddings, but, oh goodness. She rose to her feet, conventional, Cecil, you're that, for you may understand beautiful things, but you don't know how to use them, and you wrap yourself up in art and books and music, and would try to wrap up me. I won't be stifled, not by the most glorious music, for people are more glorious, and you hide them from me. That's why I break off my engagement. You were all right as long as you kept to things, but when you came to people, she stopped. There was a pause. Then Cecil said with great emotion, it is true. True on the whole, she corrected, full of some vague shame. True, every word. It is a revelation. It is, I. Anyhow, those are my reasons for not being your wife. He repeated, the sort that can know no one intimately. It is true. I fell to pieces the very first day we were engaged. I behaved like a cad to Bibi and to your brother. You are even greater than I thought. She withdrew a step. I'm not going to worry you. You are far too good to me. I shall never forget your insight, and, dear, I only blame you for this, you might have warned me in the early stages, before you felt you wouldn't marry me, and so have given me a chance to improve. I have never known you till this evening. I have just used you as a peg for my silly notions of what a woman should be. But this evening you are a different person, new thoughts, even a new voice. What do you mean by a new voice? she asked, seized with incontrollable anger. I mean that a new person seems speaking through you, said he. Then she lost her balance. She cried, if you think I am in love with someone else, you are very much mistaken. Of course I don't think that. You are not that kind, Lucy. Oh, yes, you do think it. It's your old idea, the idea that has kept Europe back, I mean the idea that women are always thinking of men. If a girl breaks off her engagement, everyone says, oh, she had someone else in her mind, she hopes to get someone else. It's disgusting, brutal. As if a girl can't break it off for the sake of freedom. He answered reverently, I may have said that in the past. I shall never say it again. You have taught me better. She began to redden and pretended to examine the windows again. 
Of course, there is no question of someone else in this, no jilting or any such nauseous stupidity. I beg your pardon most humbly if my words suggested that there was. I only meant that there was a force in you that I hadn't known of up till now. All right, Cecil, that will do. Don't apologize to me. It was my mistake. It is a question between ideals, yours and mine, pure abstract ideals, and yours are the nobler. I was bound up in the old vicious notions, and all the time you were splendid and new. His voice broke. I must actually thank you for what you have done, for showing me what I really am. Solemnly, I thank you for showing me a true woman. Will you shake hands? Of course I will, said Lucy, twisting up her other hand in the curtains. Good night, Cecil. Goodbye. That's all right. I'm sorry about it. Thank you very much for your gentleness. Let me light your candle, shall I? They went into the hall. Thank you. Good night again. God bless you, Lucy. Goodbye, Cecil. She watched him steal upstairs, while the shadows from three banisters passed over her face like the beat of wings. On the landing he paused strong in his renunciation, and gave her a look of memorable beauty. For all his culture, Cecil was an ascetic at heart, and nothing in his love became him like the leaving of it. She could never marry. In the tumult of her soul, that stood firm. Cecil believed in her, she must some day believe in herself. She must be one of the women whom she had praised so eloquently, who care for liberty and not for men, she must forget that George loved her, that George had been thinking through her and gained her this honorable release, that George had gone away into, what was it, the darkness. She put out the lamp. It did not do to think, nor, for the matter of that, to feel. She gave up trying to understand herself, and joined the vast armies of the benighted, who follow neither the heart nor the brain, and march to their destiny by catchwords. The armies are full of pleasant and pious folk. But they have yielded to the only enemy that matters, the enemy within. They have sinned against passion and truth, and vain will be their strife after virtue. As the years pass, they are censured. Their pleasantry and their piety show cracks, their wit become cynicism, their unselfishness hypocrisy, they feel and produce discomfort wherever they go. They have sinned against Eros and against Pallas Athene, and not by any heavenly intervention, but by the ordinary course of nature, those allied deities will be avenged. Lucy entered this army when she pretended to George that she did not love him, and pretended to Cecil that she loved no one. The knight received her, as it had received Miss Bartlett thirty years before. Chapter 18 Lying to Mr. Beebe, Mrs. Honeychurch, Freddy, and the Servants Windy Corner lay, not on the summit of the ridge, but a few hundred feet down the southern slope, at the springing of one of the great buttresses that supported the hill. On either side of it was a shallow ravine, filled with ferns and pine trees, and down the ravine on the left ran the highway into the Weald. Whenever Mr. Beebe crossed the ridge and caught sight of these noble dispositions of the earth, and, poised in the middle of them, windy corner, he laughed. The situation was so glorious, the house so commonplace, not to say impertinent. The late Mr. Honeychurch had affected the cube, because it gave him the most accommodation for his money, and the only addition made by his widow had been a small turret, shaped like a rhinoceros horn, where she could sit in wet weather and watch the carts going up and down the road. So impertinent, and yet the house did, for it was the home of people who loved their surroundings honestly. Other houses in the neighborhood had been built by expensive architects, over others their inmates had fidgeted sedulously, yet all these suggested the accidental, the temporary, while Windy Corner seemed as inevitable as an ugliness of nature's own creation. One might laugh at the house, but one never shuddered. Mr. Beebe was bicycling over this Monday afternoon with a piece of gossip. He had heard from the Miss Allens. These admirable ladies, since they could not go to Sissy Villa, had changed their plans. They were going to Greece instead. 
Since Florence did my poor sister so much good, wrote Miss Catherine, we do not see why we should not try Athens this winter. Of course, Athens is a plunge, and the doctor has ordered her special digestive bread, but, after all, we can take that with us, and it is only getting first into a steamer and then into a train. But is there an English church? And the letter went on to say, I do not expect we shall go any further than Athens, but if you knew of a really comfortable pension at Constantinople, we should be so grateful. Lucy would enjoy this letter, and the smile with which Mr. Beebe greeted Windy Corner was partly for her. She would see the fun of it, and some of its beauty, for she must see some beauty. Though she was hopeless about pictures, and though she dressed so unevenly, oh, that cerise frock yesterday at church, she must see some beauty in life, or she could not play the piano as she did. He had a theory that musicians are incredibly complex, and know far less than other artists what they want and what they are, that they puzzle themselves as well as their friends, that their psychology is a modern development, and has not yet been understood. This theory, had he known it, had possibly just been illustrated by facts. Ignorant of the events of yesterday he was only riding over to get some tea, to see his niece, and to observe whether Miss Honeychurch saw anything beautiful in the desire of two old ladies to visit Athens. A carriage was drawn up outside Windy Corner, and just as he caught sight of the house it started, bowled up the drive, and stopped abruptly when it reached the main road. Therefore it must be the horse, who always expected people to walk up the hill in case they tired him. The door opened obediently, and two men emerged, whom Mr. Beebe recognized as Cecil and Freddy. They were an odd couple to go driving, but he saw a trunk beside the coachman's legs. Cecil, who wore a bowler, must be going away, while Freddy, a cap, was seeing him to the station. They walked rapidly, taking the short cuts, and reached the summit while the carriage was still pursuing the windings of the road. They shook hands with the clergyman, but did not speak. So you're off for a minute, Mr. Vice, he asked. Cecil said, yes, while Freddy edged away. I was coming to show you this delightful letter from those friends of Miss Honeychurch. He quoted from it. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it romance? Most certainly they will go to Constantinople. They are taken in a snare that cannot fail. They will end by going round the world. Cecil listened civilly, and said he was sure that Lucy would be amused and interested. Isn't romance capricious? I never notice it in you young people, you do nothing but play lawn tennis, and say that romance is dead, while the Miss Allens are struggling with all the weapons of propriety against the terrible thing. A really comfortable pension at Constantinople. So they call it out of decency, but in their hearts they want a pension with magic windows opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairyland forlorn. No ordinary view will content the Miss Allens. They want the pension Keats. I'm awfully sorry to interrupt, Mr. Beebe, said Freddy, but have you any matches? I have, said Cecil, and it did not escape Mr. Beebe's notice that he spoke to the boy more kindly. You have never met these Miss Allens, have you, Mr. Vice? Never. Then you don't see the wonder of this Greek visit. I haven't been to Greece myself, and don't mean to go, and I can't imagine any of my friends going. It is altogether too big for our little lot. Don't you think so? Italy is just about as much as we can manage. Italy is heroic, but Greece is godlike or devilish, I am not sure which, and in either case absolutely out of our suburban focus. All right, Freddy, I am not being clever, upon my word I am not, I took the idea from another fellow, and give me those matches when you've done with them. He lit a cigarette, and went on talking to the two young men. I was saying, if our poor little cockney lives must have a background, let it be Italian. Big enough in all conscience. The ceiling of the Sistine Chapel for me. There the contrast is just as much as I can realize. But not the Parthenon, not the frieze of Phidias at any price, and here comes the Victoria. You're quite right, said Cecil. 
Greece is not for our little lot, and he got in. Freddy followed, nodding to the clergyman, whom he trusted not to be pulling one's leg, really. And before they had gone a dozen yards he jumped out, and came running back for Vice Matchbox, which had not been returned. As he took it, he said, I'm so glad you only talked about books. Cecil's hard hit. Lucy won't marry him. If you'd gone on about her, as you did about them, he might have broken down. But when, late last night. I must go. Perhaps they won't want me down there. No, go on. Goodbye. Thank goodness, exclaimed Mr. Beebe to himself, and struck the saddle of his bicycle approvingly, it was the one foolish thing she ever did. Oh, what a glorious riddance. And, after a little thought, he negotiated the slope into Windy Corner, light of heart. The house was again as it ought to be, cut off forever from Cecil's pretentious world. He would find Miss Minnie down in the garden. In the drawing room Lucy was tinkling at a Mozart sonata. He hesitated a moment, but went down the garden as requested. There he found a mournful company. It was a blustering day, and the wind had taken and broken the dahlias. Mrs. Honeychurch, who looked cross, was tying them up, while Miss Bartlett, unsuitably dressed, impeded her with offers of assistance. At a little distance stood Minnie in the garden child, a minute importation, each holding either end of a long piece of base. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Beebe? Gracious what a mess everything is. Look at my scarlet pom-poms, and the wind blowing your skirts about, and the ground so hard that not a prop will stick in, and then the carriage having to go out, when I had counted on having Powell, who, give everyone their due, does tie up dahlias properly. Evidently Mrs. Honeychurch was shattered. How do you do, said Miss Bartlett, with a meaning glance, as though conveying that more than dahlias had been broken off by the autumn gales. Here, Lenny, the bass, cried Mrs. Honeychurch. The garden child, who did not know what bass was, stood rooted to the path with horror. Minnie slipped to her uncle and whispered that everyone was very disagreeable today, and that it was not her fault if dahlia strings would tear long ways instead of across. Come for a walk with me, he told her. You have worried them as much as they can stand Mrs. Honeychurch, I only called in aimlessly. I shall take her up to tea at the Beehive Tavern, if I may. Oh, must you? Yes do dot, not the scissors, thank you, Charlotte, when both my hands are full already, I'm perfectly certain that the orange cactus will go before I can get to it. Mr. Beebe, who was an adept at relieving situations, invited Miss Bartlett to accompany them to this mild festivity. Yes, Charlotte, I don't want you, do go, there's nothing to stop about for, either in the house or out of it. Miss Bartlett said that her duty lay in the dahlia bed, but when she had exasperated everyone, except Minnie, by a refusal, she turned round and exasperated Minnie by an acceptance. As they walked up the garden, the orange cactus fell, and Mr. Beebe's last vision was of the garden child clasping it like a lover, his dark head buried in a wealth of blossom. It is terrible, this havoc among the flowers, he remarked. It is always terrible when the promise of months is destroyed in a moment, enunciated Miss Bartlett. Perhaps we ought to send Miss Honeychurch down to her mother. Or will she come with us? I think we had better leave Lucy to herself, and to her own pursuits. They're angry with Miss Honeychurch because she was late for breakfast, whispered Minnie, and Floyd has gone, and Mr. Vice has gone, and Freddie won't play with me. In fact, Uncle Arthur, the house is not at all what it was yesterday. Don't be a prig, said her Uncle Arthur. Go and put on your boots. He stepped into the drawing room, where Lucy was still attentively pursuing the sonatas of Mozart. She stopped when he entered. How do you do? Miss Bartlett and Minnie are coming with me to tea at the Beehive. Would you come too? I don't think I will, thank you. No, I didn't suppose you would care too much. Lucy turned to the piano and struck a few chords. How delicate those sonatas are, said Mr. Beebe, 
though at the bottom of his heart, he thought them silly little things. Lucy passed into Schumann. Miss Honeychurch. Yes. I met them on the hill. Your brother told me. Oh he did? She sounded annoyed. Mr. Beebe felt hurt, for he had thought that she would like him to be told. I needn't say that it will go no further. Mother, Charlotte, Cecil, Freddy, you, said Lucy, playing a note for each person who knew, and then playing a sixth note. If you'll let me say so, I am very glad, and I am certain that you have done the right thing. So I hoped other people would think, but they don't seem to. I could see that Miss Bartlett thought it unwise. So does Mother. Mother minds dreadfully. I am very sorry for that, said Mr. Beebe with feeling. Mrs. Honeychurch, who hated all changes, did mind, but not nearly as much as her daughter pretended, and only for the minute. It was really a ruse of Lucy's to justify her despondency, a ruse of which she was not herself conscious, for she was marching in the armies of darkness. And Freddy minds. Still, Freddy never hit it off with Vice much, did he? I gathered that he disliked the engagement, and felt it might separate him from you. Boys are so odd. Minnie could be heard arguing with Miss Bartlett through the floor. Tea at the Beehive apparently involved a complete change of apparel. Mr. Beebe saw that Lucy, very properly, did not wish to discuss her action, so after a sincere expression of sympathy, he said, I have had an absurd letter from Miss Allen. That was really what brought me over. I thought it might amuse you all. How delightful, said Lucy, in a dull voice. For the sake of something to do, he began to read her the letter. After a few words her eyes grew alert, and soon she interrupted him with, going abroad? When do they start? Next week, I gather. Did Freddy say whether he was driving straight back? No, he didn't. Because I do hope he won't go gossiping. So she did want to talk about her broken engagement. Always complacent, he put the letter away. But she, at once exclaimed in a high voice, Oh, do tell me more about the Miss Allens. How perfectly splendid of them to go abroad. I want them to start from Venice, and go in a cargo steamer down the Illyrian coast. She laughed heartily. Oh, delightful. I wish they'd take me. Has Italy filled you with the fever of travel? Perhaps George Emerson is right. He says that Italy is only an euphuism for fate. Oh, not Italy, but Constantinople. I have always longed to go to Constantinople. Constantinople is practically Asia, isn't it? Mr. Beebe reminded her that Constantinople was still unlikely, and that the Miss Allens only aimed at Athens, with Delphi, perhaps, if the roads are safe. But this made no difference to her enthusiasm. She had always longed to go to Greece even more, it seemed. He saw, to his surprise, that she was apparently serious. I didn't realize that you and the Miss Allens were still such friends, after Sissy Villa. Oh, that's nothing, I assure you Sissy Villa's nothing to me, I would give anything to go with them. Would your mother spare you again so soon? You have scarcely been home three months. She must spare me, cried Lucy, in growing excitement. I simply must go away. I have to. She ran her fingers hysterically through her hair. Don't you see that I have to go away? I didn't realize at the time, and of course I want to see Constantinople so particularly. You mean that since you have broken off your engagement you feel, yes, yes. I knew you'd understand. Mr. Beebe did not quite understand. Why could not Miss Honeychurch repose in the bosom of her family? Cecil had evidently taken up the dignified line, and was not going to annoy her. Then it struck him that her family itself might be annoying. He hinted this to her, and she accepted the hint eagerly. Yes, of course, to go to Constantinople until they are used to the idea and everything has calmed down. 
I am afraid it has been a bothersome business, he said gently. No, not at all. Cecil was very kind indeed, only, I had better tell you the whole truth, since you have heard a little, it was that he is so masterful. I found that he wouldn't let me go my own way. He would improve me in places where I can't be improved. Cecil won't let a woman decide for herself, in fact, he daren't. What nonsense I do talk. But that is the kind of thing. It is what I gathered from my own observation of Mr. Vice, it is what I gather from all that I have known of you. I do sympathize and agree most profoundly. I agree so much that you must let me make one little criticism, is it worth while rushing off to Greece? But I must go somewhere, she cried. I have been worrying all the morning, and here comes the very thing. She struck her knees with clenched fists, and repeated, I must. And the time I shall have with mother, and all the money she spent on me last spring. You all think much too highly of me. I wish you weren't so kind. At this moment Miss Bartlett entered, and her nervousness increased. I must get away, ever so far. I must know my own mind and where I want to go. Come along, T, 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 said Mr. Beebe, and bustled his guests out of the front door. He hustled them so quickly that he forgot his hat. When he returned for it he heard, to his relief and surprise, the tinkling of a Mozart sonata. She is playing again, he said to Miss Bartlett. Lucy can always play, was the acid reply. One is very thankful that she has such a resource. She is evidently much worried, as, of course, she ought to be. I know all about it. The marriage was so near that it must have been a hard struggle before she could wind herself up to speak. Miss Bartlett gave a kind of wriggle, and he prepared for a discussion. He had never fathomed Miss Bartlett. As he had put it to himself at Florence, she might yet reveal depths of strangeness, if not of meaning. But she was so unsympathetic that she must be reliable. He assumed that much, and he had no hesitation in discussing Lucy with her. Minnie was fortunately collecting ferns. She opened the discussion with, we had much better let the matter drop. I wonder. It is of the highest importance that there should be no gossip in Summer Street. It would be death to gossip about Mr. Vice's dismissal at the present moment. Mr. Beebe raised his eyebrows. Death is a strong word, surely too strong. There was no question of tragedy. He said, of course, Miss Honeychurch will make the fact public in her own way, and when she chooses. Freddy only told me because he knew she would not mind. I know, said Miss Bartlett civilly. Yet Freddy ought not to have told even you. One cannot be too careful. Quite so. I do implore absolute secrecy. A chance word to a chattering friend, and, exactly. He was used to these nervous old maids and to the exaggerated importance that they attach to words. A rector lives in a web of petty secrets, and confidences and warnings, and the wiser he is the less he will regard them. He will change the subject, as did Mr. Beebe, saying cheerfully, Have you heard from any Bertolini people lately? I believe you keep up with Miss Lavish. It is odd how we of that pension, who seemed such a fortuitous collection, have been working into one another's lives. Two, three, four, six of us, no, eight, I had forgotten the Emersons, have kept more or less in touch. We must really give the Signora a testimonial. And, Miss Bartlett not favoring the scheme, they walked up the hill in a silence which was only broken by the rector naming some fern. On the summit they paused. The sky had grown wilder since he stood there last hour, giving to the land a tragic greatness that is rare in Surrey. Grey clouds were charging across tissues of white, which stretched and shredded and tore slowly, until through their final layers there gleamed a hint of the disappearing blue. Summer was retreating. The wind roared, the trees groaned, yet the noise seemed insufficient for those vast operations in heaven. The weather was breaking up, breaking, broken 
and it is a sense of the fit rather than of the supernatural that equips such crises with the salvos of angelic artillery. Mr. Beebe's eyes rested on Windy Corner, where Lucy sat, practicing Mozart. No smile came to his lips, and, changing the subject again, he said, We shan't have rain, but we shall have darkness, so let us hurry on. The darkness last night was appalling. They reached the Beehive Tavern at about five o'clock. That amiable hostelry possesses a veranda, in which the young and the unwise do dearly love to sit, while guests of more mature years seek a pleasant sanded room and have tea at a table comfortably. Mr. Beebe saw that Miss Bartlett would be cold if she sat out, and that Minnie would be dull if she sat in, so he proposed a division of forces. They would hand the child her food through the window. Thus he was incidentally enabled to discuss the fortunes of Lucy. I have been thinking, Miss Bartlett, he said, and, unless you very much object, I would like to reopen that discussion. She bowed. Nothing about the past. I know little and care less about that, I am absolutely certain that it is to your cousin's credit. She has acted loftily and rightly, and it is like her gentle modesty to say that we think too highly of her. But the future. Seriously, what do you think of this Greek plan? He pulled out the letter again. I don't know whether you overheard, but she wants to join the Miss Allens in their mad career. It's all, I can't explain, it's wrong. Miss Bartlett read the letter in silence, laid it down, seemed to hesitate, and then read it again. I can't see the point of it myself. To his astonishment, she replied, there I cannot agree with you. In it I spy Lucy's salvation. Really? Now, why? She wanted to leave Windy Corner. I know, but it seems so odd, so unlike her, so, I was going to say, selfish. It is natural, surely, after such painful scenes, that she should desire a change. Here, apparently, was one of those points that the male intellect misses. Mr. Beebe exclaimed, so she says herself, and since another lady agrees with her, I must own that I am partially convinced. Perhaps she must have a change. I have no sisters or, and I don't understand these things. But why need she go as far as Greece? You may well ask that, replied Miss Bartlett, who was evidently interested, and had almost dropped her evasive manner. Why Greece? What is it, Minnie dear, Jam? Why not Tunbridge Wells? Oh, Mr. Beebe. I had a long and most unsatisfactory interview with dear Lucy this morning. I cannot help her. I will say no more. Perhaps I have already said too much. I am not to talk. I wanted her to spend six months with me at Tunbridge Wells, and she refused. Mr. Beebe poked at a crumb with his knife. But my feelings are of no importance. I know too well that I get on Lucy's nerves. Our tour was a failure. She wanted to leave Florence, and when we got to Rome she did not want to be in Rome, and all the time I felt that I was spending her mother's money. Let us keep to the future, though, interrupted Mr. Beebe. I want your advice. Very well, said Charlotte, with a choky abruptness that was new to him, though familiar to Lucy. I for one will help her to go to Greece. Will you? Mr. Beebe considered. It is absolutely necessary, she continued, lowering her veil and whispering through it with a passion, an intensity, that surprised him. I know, I know. The darkness was coming on, and he felt that this odd woman really did know. She must not stop here a moment, and we must keep quiet till she goes. I trust that the servants know nothing. Afterwards, but I may have said too much already. Only, Lucy and I are helpless against Mrs. Honeychurch alone. If you help we may succeed. Otherwise, otherwise? Otherwise, she repeated as if the word held finality. Yes, I will help her, said the clergyman, setting his jaw firm. Come, let us go back now, and settle the whole thing up. Miss Bartlett burst into florid gratitude. 
The tavern sign, a beehive trimmed evenly with bees, creaked in the wind outside as she thanked him. Mr. Beebe did not quite understand the situation, but then, he did not desire to understand it, nor to jump to the conclusion of another man that would have attracted a grosser mind. He only felt that Miss Bartlett knew of some vague influence from which the girl desired to be delivered, and which might well be clothed in the fleshly form. Its very vagueness spurred him into night errantry. His belief in celibacy, so reticent, so carefully concealed beneath his tolerance and culture, now came to the surface and expanded like some delicate flower. They that marry do well, but they that refrain do better. So ran his belief, and he never heard that an engagement was broken off but with a slight feeling of pleasure. In the case of Lucy, the feeling was intensified through dislike of Cecil, and he was willing to go further, to place her out of danger until she could confirm her resolution of virginity. The feeling was very subtle and quite undogmatic, and he never imparted it to any other of the characters in this entanglement. Yet it existed, and it alone explains his action subsequently, and his influence on the action of others. The compact that he made with Miss Bartlett in the tavern was to help not only Lucy, but religion also. They hurried home through a world of black and gray. He conversed on indifferent topics, the Emerson's need of a housekeeper, servants, Italian servants, novels about Italy, novels with a purpose, could literature influence life? Windy Corner glimmered. In the garden, Mrs. Honeychurch, now helped by Freddy, still wrestled with the lives of her flowers. It gets too dark, she said hopelessly. This comes of putting off. We might have known the weather would break up soon, and now Lucy wants to go to Greece. I don't know what the world's coming to. Mrs. Honeychurch, he said, go to Greece she must. Come up to the house and let's talk it over. Do you, in the first place, mind her breaking with vice? Mr. Beebe, I'm thankful, simply thankful. So am I, said Freddy. Good. Now come up to the house. They conferred in the dining room for half an hour. Lucy would never have carried the Greek scheme alone. It was expensive and dramatic, both qualities that her mother loathed. Nor would Charlotte have succeeded. The honors of the day rested with Mr. Beebe. By his tact and common sense, and by his influence as a clergyman, for a clergyman who was not a fool influenced Mrs. Honeychurch greatly, he bent her to their purpose, I don't see why Greece is necessary, she said, but as you do, I suppose it is all right. It must be something I can't understand. Lucy. Let's tell her. Lucy. She is playing the piano, Mr. Beebe said. He opened the door, and heard the words of a song, Look not thou on beauty's charming. I didn't know that Miss Honeychurch sang, too. Sit thou still when kings are arming, taste not when the wine cup glistens, it's a song that Cecil gave her. How odd girls are. What's that? called Lucy, stopping short. All right, dear, said Mrs. Honeychurch kindly. She went into the drawing room, and Mr. Beebe heard her kiss Lucy and say, I am sorry I was so cross about Greece, but it came on the top of the dahlias. Rather a hard voice said, Thank you, mother, that doesn't matter a bit. And you are right, too, Greece will be all right, you can go if the Miss Allens will have you. Oh, splendid. Oh, thank you. Mr. Beebe followed. Lucy still sat at the piano with her hands over the keys. She was glad, but he had expected greater gladness. Her mother bent over her. Freddy, to whom she had been singing, reclined on the floor with his head against her, and an unlit pipe between his lips. Oddly enough, the group was beautiful. Mr. Beebe, who loved the art of the past, was reminded of a favorite theme, the Santa Conversazione, in which people who care for one another are painted chatting together about noble things, a theme neither sensual nor sensational, and therefore ignored by the art of today. Why should Lucy want either to marry or to travel when she had such friends at home? 
Taste not when the wine cup glistens, speak not when the people listens, she continued. Here's Mr. Beebe. Mr. Beebe knows my rude ways. It's a beautiful song and a wise one, said he. Go on. It isn't very good, she said listlessly. I forget why, harmony or something. I suspected it was unscholarly. It's so beautiful. The tune's right enough, said Freddy, but the words are rotten. Why throw up the sponge? How stupidly you talk, said his sister. The Santa Conversazione was broken up. After all, there was no reason that Lucy should talk about Greece or thank him for persuading her mother, so he said goodbye. Freddy lit his bicycle lamp for him in the porch, and with his usual felicity of phrase, said, this has been a day and a half. Stop thine ear against the singer, wait a minute, she is finishing. From the red gold keep thy finger, vacant heart and hand and I easy live and quiet die. I love weather like this, said Freddy. Mr. Beebe passed into it. The two main facts were clear. She had behaved splendidly, and he had helped her. He could not expect to master the details of so big a change in a girl's life. If here and there he was dissatisfied or puzzled, he must acquiesce, she was choosing the better part. Vacant heart and hand and eye, perhaps the song stated the better part rather too strongly. He half fancied that the soaring accompaniment, which he did not lose in the shout of the gale, really agreed with Freddy, and was gently criticizing the words that it adorned, vacant heart and hand and I easy live and quiet die. However, for the fourth time Windy Corner lay poised below him, now as a beacon in the roaring tides of darkness.